All those things you never think of that can go wrong in combat are going to go wrong if you don't think about it. And you really have to get into the finite details of making sure that things are stupid simple. Because things are going to go wrong and you're going to have to react to them. I enlisted in 1980. Uh, I think I was 18. It was just after my 18th birthday. The call for me really had nothing to do with the military. It was the fact that every time I put a uniform on and I went to the field to do things, um, I found that it was really good at solving problems. I got to work with great people, and every day there was a mission and we did great stuff, and at the end, you know, and then I go back to school and it was, it was just like a grind. I hated it. And I was fortunate, and I think fortunate because the assignments I chose to, to take or pursue and the bosses that I worked with, you know, on active duty, I went to Ranger School, I went to the 82nd Airborne Division, and, you know, all that experience I had limited the point as an S3 that I could do it in my sleep. So, so by the time I become a battalion commander, it's like, you want to fight? I had to fight all day long, and, and I know how to make artillery work, I know how to tanks work, I know how patches work, I know I, I, I've done it. I've done it a hundred times, and, and I can do that all day long. More importantly, I know how to build a very simple plan, and, and so that happens. I would say by the time I got to Iraq, I was very well prepared for virtually um, Anything that had to do with combat, I was overprepared for. All the other stuff that happened, probably not so much. It's amazing what you get done when nobody gives you any time. It's like, give six months. We came back from Kosovo in, I think it was July or August of 2002, and you know, basically said you're deploying in January, February of 2003. The easiest thing to do is step back and say, you know, if I get nothing else right, I'm gonna get the small unit tactics right. So let's get everybody qualified, and then we're going to teach people how to stretch shoot. We're going to teach people how to do close quarters marksmanship. We're going to teach fire teams how to work together. We're going to teach squads how to work together. And we're going to teach um, small unit combined arms teams to work together. A Bradley and a tank together working with a squad. And if that's all we get done, we're fine. That's all we had to get done. Um, we fired probably a brigade worth of small arms ammunition in less than six months. Because they had been together for so long and because they had gone through such an intense period of training, that by the time they got some place, it was all second nature, which is exactly what we wanted. When people said, you know, you're gonna to go to Fallujah, you're gonna do this, it's like, I'm gonna plan it. There's no way in hell that, that somebody's gonna make a decision to commit us to go into an urban area with an armor task force. It does not happen. And so it was like, yeah, we're gonna plan this thing, we're gonna plan it, and eventually they're gonna work out a deal and something will happen, because um, the idea that, that you're gonna launch a division into a built-up area for the first time since Vietnam, it's just ludicrous. We don't do that. You know, particularly because people don't leave built-up areas anymore. You just, you don't get in a cat flight in the middle of an urban area, it's just a bad idea. <laughs> so what do we do? We got a cat fight in an urban area. I think somewhere there's an AAR comment from one of the attached commanders who's basically said, I don't ever remember being given an op order. We just rehearsed the shit out of this. We walked that train model over and over and over again. Talking about fire control measures, who's to the left, who's to the right, what networks you're on, what is supposed to happen, over and over and over again. So it was second nature. It really got easy to make changes. But I realized as soon as we hit the city is, you know, we couldn't see anything. So rather than go into the city following sun, it was as we get up on the highway, a big berm and it was elevated that went right along the city. And we could sit um, astride of where his front line was. 
and see his movement almost precisely. And then we realized not only could we see his movement, we could see the combatants' movement. And then we realized that we could shoot them better than he could. Uh, so we did. Um, you know, we lined up a tank, a Bradley uh, Fist V, which is a fire support vehicle with a, a ground laser designator uh, and a sniper team that we picked up from the Marines, which would line them up on the road. And, and essentially, we're able to watch the forward trace of that company. And as things started moving behind between cities, we were able to engage all the way across it. Eventually got to the point that we were engaging entire, across the entire Brigade AO because the GLID and the tank sites could see and very precisely provide grids for um, cannon fires. It allowed us to proceed through the city much faster. The bad was the rest of the brigade wasn't moving. You know, and I think we spent probably the first 24 hours by ourselves inside uh, Fallujah across the entire division front. We were the only ones inside the city for a long period of time. We did a lot of damage though. I mean, I, I say, because we were the only ones there, um, people were either trying to get out of our way or trying to get in our way. And, and we had the perfect uh, fire support position that allowed us to use every ass that you could think of to, to, to kill them. It wasn't until we hit phase line Fran where we got a chance to actually look one another in the eyes and get an assessment of how exhausted we were, how fried were we, what was the, what was the concern. And, and at that point, it was somewhere between 24 and 36 hours that we had been up. And that was on top of all the prep with no sleep. That, I think it, literally, I don't think there was anybody who uh, was not under 30, 32 hours of no sleep. And they were still functional. But, but you could see a crash coming. And at some point you really needed to, to figure out, we, we had to figure out how we were gonna manage that. It, it went so fast that, you know, I, I talk about 96 hours. We fought for 96 hours. There was somebody in the task force in a firefight every hour for 96 hours. And, and some of that was by design is, you know, we really figured out that, that if we gave anybody a rest, they would have time to think about how they were gonna organize the defense and do something. So we gave nobody a rest. And we kept um, the scheme that we came up with while we were in, sitting along face line front waiting for the Marines to keep up was we were gonna rotate platoons off the battlefield, over the highway, to um, our field trains, which were a thousand meters outside the city, protected by this big berm, but we were gonna rotate them out and get them all at least three or four hours of sleep so that we could you know, continue the fight on. We kept that up for the rest of the battle. So leaving Fran after we cleared the industrial area, you know, the Marines made the decision, they said, you, you two armored task forces are, are doing a lot of great work, so you're now gonna move ahead and and close off the real estate study. It was in that process where we, we were supposed to start this attack at something like eight, eight or nine o'clock at night, but they were unable to move the brigade that was screening south of Fallujah out of the way fast enough. So we got delayed until like well after midnight which meant that um, we were still moving when the sun came up. So we got caught in that transition period of um, night vision devices versus not. And, and we literally were at the point of pulling nods off and doing things and just happened to be sitting um, in a really well-designed um, ambush site where, where we found that, you know, the, the trust south of phase line Fran, it was no longer the Iraqi brigade rebels, it was hardcore Al-Qaeda. I mean, even the Iraqis did go down there. It was hardcore, gonna die here, Al-Qaeda folks who were hopped up on drugs that were gonna go out at the last man. I mean, that's, that's how Sean Sims got killed, that's how um, the Alpha Company XO got killed, that's how the ambush got kicked off, that's, you know, most of the 
most of the losses we had, you know, came from the fights that were down south with, with the true hardcore terrorists. Yeah, but, but they were living in spider holes outside the buildings, not inside the buildings where you would expect them to find. And, you know, it wasn't until the sun came up when we actually cleared that area we realized what had happened. Coming out of Fallujah was like, glad this is done, but we, we still have a whole other problem to take care of. And, and really had to make that transition rapidly because we left a void. But any time to think about the battle and, you know, all the other things that happened, we had enough time to have um, um, a ceremony to recognize, you know, the folks that we lost. And then it right back to the fight. I don't think a day goes by that something doesn't pop up about Fallujah. And it's, I don't say it's weird as you get older, you know, it's like your mind starts to play tricks on you. That this, you get these fleeting images and it's trying to resolve the image. Like, when did this happen? Who was this? And did it happen the way that it was supposed to? Um, there's, you know, to some extent, not just the battle, but also the, you know, the mental challenge of managing people and things like that. And, and trying to piece it apart and, and then put it back together and, and reorder it. So I, I think I'm fortunate that um, I don't, I guess in lots of forms of post-traumatic stress and mine is, is just like fried into my memory. Um, it doesn't, um, there's no sense of guilt for me. I mean, I, uh, I hate that, that we lost the, the great young men and women did throughout. Um, I hate that their families have you know, gone on without them, that their children have grown up not knowing you know, their fathers. My oldest son, you know, he talks about being a, a 13 year old in the house and you know, there was a black phone in the house, like a DSN line. And whenever somebody was killed, that line ran and it was really attached to a commander calling my wife. And he panicked every time that phone rang. He relates the story of sitting at the top of the stairs when something happened and being scared to death it was me. It was in the middle of Fallujah. And, and being relieved, not relieved that it was Captain Simmons, but being relieved that it's not your dad. And then, and then there's this sense of guilt. It was, oh my God, you lost your husband and I'm relieved. And, and he carried that for years. I mean, it was probably a good 10 years before he finally had to reconcile it in his own version of post-traumatic stress. Where he actually, you know, I don't know what he said, he sent a letter and I had a conversation with Heidi Sims and said, yeah, I'm so sorry, but, but this is how I felt and what I did. Um, Heidi, to a good gracious, said, oh my God, <laughs> you as a child have no business carrying that. But think about the effect on these families to have to do this knowing that the combat's not over. We're still in Fallujah. We're still in the middle of the fight. Somebody is next. We have not even begun to scratch the surface of what our families have gone through. Not the wives, not the parents, and certainly not the kids who grew up um, at war. I mean, you know, that's really um, conflicted. Obviously, I have a tremendous amount of pride in the performance of the men and women. I, I'm, I, to this day, I wish we could tell all of the stories of all of the people who were involved because there were so many um, amazing personalities who did things that were above and beyond the call that anybody would ever expect. That battalion or that task force, and I have to say the task force was truly unique. Uh, you know, it would be hard to recreate it because of the circumstances and the people around it. So I want them to remember how good they were. They really were truly tremendous human beings. Mm -hmm.